So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. And thank you also to Dustin for that great talk. We're going to switch gears here um, from that very evidence-based medicine and go over some toxicology, which I think is always interesting, uh, as well as a little bewildering for myself, at least. This talk uh, was actually prompted by an actual case I had in the Foothills ER, and we'll be using it as a reference and a guide as we move through. The title is Serotonin Toxicity, and I realize uh, that serotonin syndrome has been the more familiar term for many decades, but serotonin toxicity is entering the nomenclature. It's more accurate, and I think it is a more useful way in framing the way we think about and pick up on this entity. So I'd like to acknowledge these individuals uh, who contributed to the presentation, particularly Dr. Lusick. Uh, and I have no disclosures. So I'd like to begin this grand rounds with a story, one which I think everyone listening uh, today has heard at one point or another and now you're going to get my version of it. There's a light rain falling in New York City the evening of March 4th, 1984, when Libby Zion, at the time an 18-year-old freshman in Bennington College in Vermont, presented to the New York Hospital Emergency Department. She showed up at 11.30 p.m. complaining of flu-like symptoms after having a tooth extracted a few days prior. She was taking phenylzine, which is an irreversible MAOI for anxiety and depression, and may have been using cocaine, which was not disclosed to the staff. In the emergency department, she had a fever and an elevated white count to go along with some weird behaviors and odd movements. The ER physician was unsure about the diagnosis, but he recommended admission given her high fever and the strange jerking motions Libby was making. And so, as the rain turned into snow outside, she was admitted upstairs on March 5th at 2 a.m. Both the intern and junior resident on call assessed Libby and noted her agitation. The junior resident made a tentative diagnosis of a viral syndrome with hysterical symptoms. They sent off blood, urine and stool cultures, held her phenylzine, gave Tylenol for her fever, and they prescribed Demerol for her agitation and shivering. They both then went off to look after the other 40 or so odd patients under their care that night. After the Demerol, Libby became more agitated. She started thrashing around in the bed and pulled out her IV. The nurses paged the intern who ordered physical restraints for the agitation and one milligram of Haldol. The antipsychotic did seem to have a temporary calming effect on Libby. However, at 6 a.m., her temperature spiked to 42 degrees, and despite Tylenol, cold compresses, and a cooling blanket, she went into cardiorespiratory arrest and was unable to be resuscitated. As you see, the combination of events leading to this tragic occurrence uh, appear along the bottom of the slide. I think it's important to remember that we are looking at this with the benefit of hindsight and 35 years of medical knowledge keeping in mind that serotonin syndrome had only been described in medical literature just two years earlier, and information was not disseminated rapidly through the phone web world like it is today. In the wake of this tragedy, Libby's father pressed for an investigation into the circumstances that led to her death, and this resulted in several changes to the medical education system, particularly resident work hours and supervision. So before we get going, I want to highlight that it's very difficult to conduct good randomized control trials or prospective cohort studies in toxicology, and consequently there is a lack of high quality evidence in the literature. This is highlighted in the bar graph to the right. It shows a breakdown of published articles in The Lancet, Annals of Emergency Medicine, and the Journal of Toxicology from 1981 to 2001. To be clear, this is not in any way a criticism of toxicology simply a recognition that its very, matru very nature makes the scientific method of research very challenging. So this talk is split into four parts. We'll go over first the history, epidemiology, and pharmacology of serotonin toxicity as succinctly as possible. We will discuss the history and exam findings that make us more suspicion of excess serotonin. Thirdly, we'll lay out the key investigations in serotonin toxicity and the formal hunter diagnostic criteria. 
And finally, we'll flesh out what supportive management really means and address some specific questions that a, uh, some eMERGE staff had around the management. As a quick background, serotonin toxicity has a long and interesting history. It may have been responsible for afflictions like St. Anthony's fire in the Middle Ages and sparking the solemn witch trials in colonial New England. More recently, it came into the medical community's knowledge in the early 1960s with the development of monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Serotonin syndrome itself was formally classified in 1982, although widespread recognition would take several decades to develop. In fact, in 1999, a survey of, over, uh, survey of general practitioners in Britain showed that over 85% had not even heard of it as a clinical diagnosis. This data is from the 2018 American Association of Poison Control Report. Antidepressants were the fifth most common human exposure, the third most common adult exposure, the ninth most, most common cause of fatality, and were the number one increase in serious exposures year over year between 20, 2000 to 2010 and 2010 to 2018. Currently, serotonergic agents are widespread in Canada. From 2007 to 11, antidepressants were the number one prescription among women ages 25 to 79 and among men 25 to 44 years. This is data of emergency department visits in Calgary for the last three years that were either given the diagnostic code for SSRI overdose, SNRI overdose, or an unspecified antidepressant overdose. This is obviously a less than complete list since several prescription or per, several presentations may have been given different codes uh, by the staff. I use these statistics to illustrate how widespread serotonergic agents are and emphasize that serotonin toxicity is likely far more prevalent than we might realize. We likely miss many cases because they're mild and actually, it's actually quite difficult to diagnose unless you're specifically thinking about it. However, even more serious cases are not uncommon. One of the larger studies estimated a 15% prevalence for moderate to severe serotonin syndrome after SSRI uh, alone overdose. This section is going to be brief. In a nutshell, serotonin is synthesized in the dietary amino acid L-tryptophan and stored in vesicles. It's then dumped into the synaptic cleft whenever serotonergic neurons decide to fire. If it doesn't get stored, monoamine oxidase rapidly inactivates it. Once the serotonin is in the synaptic cleft, it can give feedback inhibition, get recycled, or it can activate any of its 14 known receptors. So how does cranking up the levels of this molecule produce a spectrum of illness? It's a good question, and the exact pathophysiologic mechanism for serotonin toxicity has been difficult to pin down. The current idea is based on animal models. It's that the only, the only excessive stimulation of certain receptor subtypes results in the severe features of serotonin toxicity. Specifically, these are the 1A and 2A receptors in the central nervous system. Boiling it down, animal models show a particular set of behaviors in the setting of serotonin excess. These appear to be primarily mediated through the 1A receptor. Meanwhile, the hyperthermia and serotonin toxicity seems to arise from agonism of the 2A receptor. This is going to be the framework for the pathophysiology of this talk, but in reality, things are a lot more complicated. Dopamine, norepinephrine, and GABA receptors all play important supporting roles. So let's review the first section. Serotonergic drugs are extremely common. Increased amounts of CNS serotonin lead to excessive stimulation of serotonin's 1A and 2A receptors. These are the primary drivers of serotonin toxicity. Now let's get into the actual case that I had and use it as a framework to talk about the medications that heighten your suspicion for serotonin toxicity and what differential and exam findings will lead you down that path. I was working in the foothills emerge when my preceptor and I got called to A20. EMS had brought in a 23-year-old female who was found unresponsive in her bed at 10 a.m. She was last seen well at midnight. On scene, she had a GCS of 3, which improved to 6 with 0.4 of Norcan, 
along with an increase in her respiratory rate from 20 to 40. She was febrile, tachycardic, and initially was hypoxic at 78% on room air before being given oxygen four liters by nasal prongs. The only history we had was that she had been feeling unwell the previous week and had been swabbed for COVID at the Rocky View. In summary, this was a febrile patient with an altered mental status, which brings us to our first differential, a hot and altered patient. The differential bleak can be approached with the dives mnemonic, which we are all familiar with. Start with ruling out serious ideologies like meningitis and sepsis. At that moment in our case, we were initially wondering, could this be a COVID pneumonia? Could it be sepsis? Could it be meningitis? From a toxicology perspective, the closest mimics of serotonin syndrome will be other toxidromes, calicolamine excess, as well as anticholinergic poisoning. As we start to simplify this list, we wind up with four toxicities and three withdrawals that can mimic serotonin toxicity by presenting with a patient who has an, uh, an elevated temperature and an altered mental status. Now, before moving back to the case, I wanna clear up any confusion anyone might have surrounding the difference between neuroleptic malignant syndrome and serotonin toxicity. My own personal theory for why this occurs in the first place is that these diseases are first taught to us in psychiatry, in medical school, as part of medication side effects. And hence, they just keep getting lumped together. Now, they do share some autonomic features, but these are actually two very different entities, and we're going to break it down. If any of you are descriptive learners, this is your slide. On the left, we have Parkinson's from hell, representing NMS. Bonus points if you know who that is and why I chose him. And on the right is the monkey on meth representing serotonin toxicity. The most important clue in telling these two apart is the history. Ask these two questions. Number one, did this occur over hours or over days? And number two, is the patient taking serotonin agonists or dopamine antagonists? Now, sometimes you won't have the answer. The patient is uptunded, there is no collateral, neck care is down, etc. And you're faced with a patient who has an altered mental status, autonomic instability, and hyperthermia, all features of both. In these cases, go to your neuromuscular exam. If the patient has Parkinson's from hell, they're bradykinetic, hyporeflexic, and they have severe rigidity. If they're a monkey on meth, they're hyperkinetic, hyperreflexic, and they have clonus. Keep in mind that severe serotonin toxicity at the severe end of the spectrum can have impressive rigidity, which might suppress the clonus. Back to the case. Outside the room, the other members of the healthcare team have been getting collateral information. A search of her net care med list reveals she filled a prescription for amoxiclav and vilazidone, which is a potent SSRI yesterday. The assortment of pills in the Ziploc bag that EMS found on her dresser are identified by the pharmacist as Zopiclone, Trazodone, Hydromorphone, and Xanax. So this brings us to the second step in our diagnosis. What medications increase your pre-test probability of serotonin toxicity? The medical literature is absolutely awash with case reports of serotonin toxicity from just about any drug. Some of these are more credible than others, given their mechanism of action. To simplify this slide, um, I've highlighted three classes which contain more than 70% of the agents listed and are also in widespread use. The antidepressant medications are the most familiar to us. SSRIs, SNRIs, MAOIs, TCAs, and atypicals. The stimulant class contains amphetamines, cocaine, and MDMA. Opioids are widely used in the emergency department and are well represented in case reports. The literature around certain agents within this class is controversial and we'll go over which ones you should be specifically concerned about a little later on. Finally, I'd like to draw your attention to some drugs which are very common but under-recognized for their interactions with the cytochrome P450 enzyme apparatus. To clarify, I'm not suggesting that you don't prescribe Cipro for a UTI to the patient who is also on sertraline, 
just try to think of it if they come to the emergency department with sweating, tremor, tachycardia, and clonus. I wanted to take two minutes here to discuss opioids and how they can contribute to serotonin toxicity through a variety of mechanisms. For some context, in March of 2016, the FDA issued a drug safety communication concerning the risk of serotonin toxicity with the use of opioids. This blanket warning is questionable, but there are numerous uh, case reports and uh, studies that implicate opioids. A French pharmacovigilance database search from 1985 to 2013 found an association between opioids <clears throat> and another serotonergic agent implicated in greater than 25% of serotonin toxicity cases. I'll go through the listed narcotics, narcotics here relatively briefly. I think the important takeaway point is that opioids are a major drug class, they're widespread, and some of its members have a high potential for serotonin toxicity. So Demerol, this is a potent SSRI, and there are case reports of it being a sole agent in serotonin toxicity. Tramadol is a drug with SNRI properties in addition to its opioid metabolite. It's the most frequently implicated opioid when combined with other serotonergic agents. And there are case reports of it causing serotonin toxicity as the sole agent. Methadone and dextromethorphan can increase serotonin levels by their action on the CYP enzymes, as well as having innate serotonergic activity. They probably can't cause serotonin toxicity as the sole agent. Methadone and or, uh, fentanyl has weak S SRI activity and is a serotonin 1A receptor agonist. There are numerous interactions with other serotonergic agents reported in the literature. Of note to ER physicians, there are reports of patients on SSRIs who develop serotonin toxicity after they receive fentanyl during procedural sedation. Oxycodone, hydromorphone, and morphine have scattered case reports of serotonin toxicity in conjunction with other more potent serotonergic agents. Their actions on serotonin are the least well delineated and have the fewest case reports. The bottom line is never ordered Demerol or Tramadol, methadone, dextromethorphan, and fentanyl in the patient with acute serotonin toxicity. If you need pain control, go to hydromorphone or morphine. Now the onset of serotonin toxicity is rapid. It occurs in 30% of patients within one hour and 60% within six hours, while virtually everyone has symptoms within 24 hours. The vast majority of cases are due to the addition of a new serotonergic drug, an increased dose of a current drug, or an intentional overdose. There are scattered case reports of serotonin toxicity while on therapeutic doses of a single agent. Keep in mind, drugs like the MAOIs and fluoxetine have half-lives on the order of weeks. So if the patient has discontinued these drugs at any point within the past four weeks, they could still be an exerting an effect. If any of you are like me and can't remember all the drug interactions off the top of your head, there's a handy application on your up-to-date app. It will quickly analyze a patient's medication and give you a readout of the interactions. Going back to the case, we actually did a relatively complete tox toxiconeurologic exam. This included GCS, pupils, axilla, and a focused neuro MSK assessment. These features are really, when you're, are really where your money is going to be with the suspected overdose patient. Her pupils were dilated, the axilla were moist, and the extremities were rigid with hyperactive reflexes and spontaneous clonus evident. We were still kicking the tires on meningitis, so we covered with acyclovir and ceftriaxone vanco for the time being. We now have an altered hyperthermic patient with clonus. This is our third differential. Clonus is a fairly specific sign for serotonin toxicity, and the list of other conditions it is found in is actually relatively short. Several of them should be straightforward to rule out. Dr. Chris Hahn of Neurology was kind enough to help me put together this list. In serotonin toxicity, the clonus can be spontaneous or elicited, and it should be bilateral. It's usually more prominent in the lower extremities with associated hyperreflexia, and there should be no other uh, obvious explanation for it, like a stroke or cerebral palsy. So this was a 46-year-old woman who overdosed on 
than the fact scene. She came in agitated, hyperthermic, and tachycardic. The ocular clonus is quite striking and very different from nystagmus. In the second part of this video, you can see her rigidity and tremor. That video isn't going to play for me, but uh, in that video, there's a 55-year-old man with a history uh, of ischemic stroke and the dorsiflexion of his right foot. Um, oh, I can get it to play like this. Uh, the dorsiflexion of his right foot here produces a sustained clonus. And this is exactly um, what our patient had. I wanted to briefly highlight the three investigations we got on this hot and altered patient. And these ones give you a great deal of information when you have the toxidromic patient. Number one, point of care glucose. This is a no brainer, not necessarily part of the hot and altered toxidrome, but hypoglycemia is easy to rule out and easy to treat. Number two, the VBG. It allows us to assess the acid base status, address concerns for salicylate poisoning, and alerts us to electrolyte abnormalities from rhabdo or acidosis. And number three, the EKG. It helps to rule out QRS widening from TCA overdose, QTC prolongation from SSRIs, and ST changes from cocaine. From here, add on your usual cocktail of a toxidromic workup. In the hot and altered patient, I would specifically add a CK to check for rhabdo. So let's review what we just covered. Remember the challenge in diagnosing serotonin toxicity is considering the possibility in the first place. The main serotonergic drugs we will see are antidepressants, stimulants, and opioids. Number two, the hot and altered patient needs serious illnesses like meningitis and sepsis ruled out, then go through the short list of toxicities and withdrawals. And finally, check for clonus. Let's move on to the literature and the formal diagnosis of serotonin toxicity in part three. The first attempt at creating a definition for serotonin syndrome was actually just based on 38 case reports by Sternbach in 1991. By his criteria, serotonin syndrome could be established by the presence of three or more of 10 clinical features. Unfortunately, there were a number of problems with the criteria the most egregious probably being his inclusion of four separate altered mentation symptoms. This made it possible to diagnose serotonin syndrome based on cognitive changes alone. Radomsky tried to refine the Sternbach criteria by evaluating an additional 24 cases and specifying major and minor criteria. However, in 2003, these rules were supplanted by the Hunter criteria, which are the most widely used today. The Hunter Area Toxicology Service is a regional toxicology unit based out of Newcastle Misericordia Hospital in Australia. The group there led by Dunkley took all the poisoning admissions after overdose on a serotonergic drug from 1987 to 2002. They then formulated a decision tree by including the symptoms which recurred at a statistically significant frequency in the patients that had been formally diagnosed with serotonin toxicity. They found that only five criteria were needed to predict uh, accurately serotonin toxicity. Agitation, diaphoresis, tremor, hyperreflexia, and clonus. This generated a clinical decision tree which had 84% sensitivity and 97% and specificity for the gold standard. In this case, they used the clinical diagnosis uh, by a medical toxicologist. The algorithm isn't perfect. The learning data set used to derive the criteria came from 473 patients who had single SSRI alone overdoses, and these were added to the cases of other serotonergic overdoses for the validation. The criteria may not be applicable in patients with polypharmacy overdose or in patients with underlying neurologic disease. Additionally, there have been no external validation studies done of the Hunter criteria to this point. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the shift towards using the term serotonin toxicity 
to define the effects of serotonin excess has already occurred. These effects tend to occur in three clinical domains, cognitive, autonomic, and neuromuscular, and can present with a wide range of severity. I think the picture to the right illustrates this nicely. Serotonin toxicity could be the person with restlessness and diarrhea, or it can be the person with rigidity and severe hyperthermia. The bottom line is that serotonin toxicity is challenging to define and to diagnose. It requires a high index of suspicion and attention to medications, vital signs, and the neuromuscular exam. So let's review part three. The Hunter criteria have excellent specificity compared to the gold standard of a medical toxicologist and should pick up those cases which require timely and aggressive intervention. Be aware, it's going to miss some cases at the mild end of the spectrum. Serotonin toxicity is a spectrum of disease that manifests with different intensity in the cognitive, autonomic, and neuromuscular domains. Okay, last part, here we go. Let's talk about how to treat these patients. Our management of our patient was fairly straightforward. We gave four milligrams of Ativan, which had a beneficial effect by decreasing the tremors and spontaneous clonus. We've decided she needed a head CT given the uncertainty around the presentation and decided to intubate for airway protection and maintenance since the patient was leaving the department. Paralysis was accomplished using succinylcholine since we felt she might require a rapid repeat neuro exam. And this was felt to be safe since the potassium on the BVG was only 3.6. Her temperature at the time was only 38.1. So we gave her fluids, but did not do any other active cooling. So let's discuss supportive care and specify what that really entails. The disease is a spectrum, so the treatments for different severities are going to bleed into each other. The first step is stopping all serotonergic agents and taking care not to give them any more. You can review the chart back on slide 19 for this. The patient must not be physically restrained. The hyperthermia and severe serotonin toxicity is not hypothalamically mediated and will worsen if they are fighting against their restraints. If they do have to be used because of patient safety or staff safety, then replace them with chemical sedation rapidly. For the same reason, Tylenol is not indicated for the temperature in these cases. Oxygen saturations should be maintained greater than 94% to optimize the activity of monoamine oxidase. The next treatments will follow a stepwise progression depending on the degree of toxicity. For mild symptoms of anxiety or restlessness, start off with a benzodiazepine. An elevated temperature, hyperreflexia, or clonus warrants more aggressive treatment with higher and more frequent doses of benzodiazepines and aggressive and rapid external cooling. Severe serotonin toxicity is a true emergency. It requires high doses of benzodiazepines, cooling, and likely paralysis and intubation. The role of benzodiazepines in the management of serotonin toxicity is well established, though like all of our treatments, there is an absence of human RCTs guiding us here. A couple of examples are presented. In 2001, Nishima et al. showed that prophylactic diazepam can attenuate the development of hyperthermia in rats, although there was no effect on the mort mortality rate. In an underpowered human study, Mansurapur et al. found that chlordiazepoxide reduced the development of Hunter criteria serotonin toxicity in tramadol overdose. Benzodiazepines are a nonspecific serotonin antagonist that also blunt the hyperadrenergic component of serotonin toxicity. They decrease patient discomfort and promote muscle relaxation. This allows them to be effective in treating the two most worrisome components, rigidity and hyperthermia. So let's talk about which patients with serotonin toxicity should be intubated. At times, this is a difficult call to make because so many patients with serotonin toxicity rapidly improve once the offending agents have been stopped, often within hours. However, there are two situations which are relatively unique to serotonin toxicity, which require paralysis. And because they require paralysis, you're going to need a tube. The first indication is profound hyperthermia. Reading through the literature, you will keep finding 41.1 Celsius as the temperature recommended at which to paralyze and intubate these patients. However, I was unable to find any evidence to support this temperature. 
My guess is that in the hyperthermia literature, there are observational studies suggesting once core temperature reaches 41.5 to 42 degrees Celsius, the mortality curve starts to seepen rapidly due to the end organ dysfunction. The second indication is profound rigidity to the point where the patient's respiratory muscles become so contracted that they can't move air in or out. Once these patients are paralyzed, continue the infusion of the paralytic. Case reports suggest that the premature termination of the paralytic is associated with recrudescence of the hyperthermia. Don't forget about all your standard indications for intubation. As we've discussed, serotonin toxicity arises from excessive stimulation of the 1A and 2A receptors. Ciproheptidine is an oral antihistamine with anti-serotonin and anticholinergic effects. There is a large amount of literature in animal models and case studies suggesting that ciproheptidine is effective in treating serotonin toxicity. Nishima et al. did an experiment where they took rats and gave them large doses of an MAOI and L-tryptophan. This resulted in an increase in the rectal temperature of the rats to greater than 40 Celsius, and all the animals died. Ciproheptidine at high doses, 10 milligrams per kilogram, prevented the lethality of the rats, although at five milligrams per kilogram, it had no effect on the mortality. In humans, McDaniel described four cases of serotonin syndrome diagnosed by the Sternbach criteria, whose symptoms responded to ciproheptidine dosing. However, none of these patients were hyperthermic or had clonus. In case study number one, Grouden's in 1998 published a case series detailing five female patients with a history of a recent exposure to serotonergic medications and meeting Sternbeck's criteria for serotonin syndrome. They were given ciproheptidine at a dose ranging from 48 milligrams. Within two hours, three of the five had complete resolution, while the other two required a repeat dose before their symptoms resolved. There were no adverse outcomes reported. This is a relatively bare bones case series with just five patients who had mild to moderate symptoms. None of them were altered or hyperthermic, and only two of them had clonus. There is no mention of toxicologist correlation, and it doesn't provide any data about patient mortality or what other treatments the patients received. In 2020, Fry published a larger case series out of the University of Iowa, where they analyzed 28 patients with serotonin toxicity who were treated with ciproheptidine. A toxicologist had diagnosed five of the 28, and 11 of the 28 met the Hunter criteria. These patients seemed sicker than the Groudon's case series. 18 were there secondary to a suicidal overdose attempt. Larger and more frequent doses of ciproheptidine were given. 28 to 36 milligrams seemed to be the most common initial dose. 22 of them were treated in the ICU, and almost half had clonus or hyperthermia. In the end, only one of the patients died from septic shock and hypoxemic respiratory failure in the setting of pre-existing uh, chronic liver failure. There are several difficulties in analyzing this literature. It was a single center case analysis with no control group. Ciproheptidine was given at the attending physician's discretion and average time to the first dose was actually 1.1 days after admission. There was poor documentation and missing data. In our last analysis, in 2020, Niyun et al. published an 11-year retrospective review of cases from the California Poison Control System Database, which involves ciproheptidine administration or consideration of it for the treatment of possible or probable serotonin syndrome. All of these cases received supportive care. Out of 1,420 cases identified, 288 met their inclusion criteria. 68 of the 288 received ciproheptidine treatment. These patients tended to be older, more likely to be intubated, and were more frequently admitted to a critical care unit. In 138 of the cases, ciproheptine was recommended, but not given for various reasons. The most common one was minimal clinical severity and patient improvement. In 82 of the cases, ciproheptidine was not recommended for a variety of reasons. Overall, this was a fairly sick patient population given the high percentage of intubations at 34% overall. On analysis, there are no significant differences between the group that received ciproheptidine and the group that did not with respect to serious outcomes or hospitalization rates. <laughs>
there were eight total fatalities. Those who've received Cipro had a 2.9% fatality rate, and those that did not had a 2.7% fatality rate. All of these were in the setting of polypharmacy overdoses. Again, there are several limitations with this review. It was not prospective or randomized. The diagnosis of possible or probable serotonin syndrome was based on the health side or the bedside healthcare team's assessment and rather than any sort of strict criteria like the hunter. There were many cases lacking. Information on the timing and duration of ciproheptidine administration was not available and the inclusion of polypharmacy patients clouds the results picture. The author's takeaway uh, took this into account as they felt the benefits and indications for ciproheptidine are uncertain and questionable in the management of serotonin syndrome. So what's the bottom line on ciproheptidine? Currently, there is no high quality evidence supporting its use and our ability to conduct this research will be challenging given the nature of the question we're trying to ask. There are some case reports and series which appear to show a positive response and the actual pharmacology behind its use is responsible, is reasonable. Several guidelines recommend considering its administration in serotonin toxicity, including Goldfranks and the Poisoning and Drug Overdose Edition. Physicians considering giving it should discuss this with their toxicologist. Now, I had a chat with Dr. Lusick about which patients need ciproheptidine, and he, uh, he picked out two patient populations that he thought it might be beneficial in. Number one was patients who have moderate symptoms but don't require any cooling or paralysis and intubation. And his second group was basically patients who have had everything else thrown at them they're intubated, they're in the ICU, uh, they're still not improving, and you're just using everything at your disposal. And uh, I just want to mention again at the end, lastly, that we can underestimate the harms of giving medications, and ciproheptidine uh, can be detri detrimental to patients in certain situations. One example would be uh, the patient who also has significant anticholinergic toxicity from a TCA overdose uh, with other agents, and the anti-muscarinic activity of Cipro uh, is going to worsen all those anticholinergic effects like tachycardia uh, and hypotension. So let's review our fourth section. The currently accepted diagnostic criteria for serotonin syndrome are the Hunter criteria. They have excellence uh, specificity at 97%, sensitivity is okay at 84%, but these were derived in 2003 and they were not all encompassing of the wide spectrum of serotonin toxicity. Immediately get a glucose, BBG, and EKG in your hot and altered patient. Benzodiazepines and rapid aggressive cooling are going to be your therapeutic mainstays for moderate to severe serotonin toxicity. If the hyperthermia is greater than 41 Celsius, or the patient has severe rigidity compromising their ventilation, paralyze and intubate them. And lastly, ciproheptidine's utility is controversial and should not take place or delay care with benzodiazepines or cooling. So I'll just let you know what the conclusion of this case was. Um, quite unfortunately, this patient went on to have a, a, a poor outcome. Her neuroimaging showed acute infarcts in the high metabolic areas um, of the, the, the cerebellum. Um, and this was consistent with basically what Rav's Raz described as a toxic uh, leukoencephalopathy. Um, she did go on to develop uh, severe swelling in her brain and mass effect. Did not require um, decompression by neurosurge though. Uh, her urine drug screen came back positive for benzos, uh, cocaine, dextromethorphan, physopicone, and trazodone. She uh, wound up getting three EEGs um, post-admission day one, six, and 11 during her stay in the ICU. Uh, basically showing a severe diffuse encephalopathic process with, um, with something that was consistent with a moderate uh, to severe uh, global cerebral dysfunction. Um, she uh, wound up getting a trach and uh, 16 days after admission was discharged from the ICU, but um, in, in reading the notes, her GCS currently is, is fluctuating somewhere between six and eight from what I can tell and um, really is, is unable to follow any commands and ha has complete dependence uh, for her EDLs.
So this is our last slide, takeaway points. The hyperthermia of serotonin toxicity is caused by the 2A receptor. Antidepressants, stimulants, and opioids are the drugs which are largely responsible. Serotonin produces effects in three domains, cognitive, autonomic, and neuromuscular. Treat hyperthermia rapidly and aggressively with benzodiazepines and aggressive cooling. And lastly, if you're considering ciproheptadine, get on the phone and discuss it with the toxicologist. And that's everything. Thank you everyone for, for tuning in and listening. It does look like we have one question in the Q&A and uh, maybe a couple more coming in. And uh, it looks like Dr. Lusick has been able to join us as well. Yeah, um, yeah, good question. Uh, so is serotonin syndrome from Dr. Federick, is ser oh, uh, one from Aaron Johnson. Uh, tramadol is a more frequent post-op prescription um, by many of the surgical colleagues. And I've certainly seen patients on both post-op tramadol and antidepressants. Aside from uh, ad hoc deprescribing by us, any ideas about system level improvements to keep patients safe? Have we seen an increase in serotonin syndrome patients concurrent with the rise in tramadol prescriptions in Calgary? Um, that I don't know the answer to. I don't, um, I wasn't able to get statistics from uh, NetCare on the um, number of tramadol prescriptions that are given out. Um, I think partly it may be just sort of colleague to colleague discussion um, with our surgical colleagues who are giving it um, as far as kind of sharing our literature with them around it. Um, which they're obviously not reading because they have they have other priorities. Um, but I I don't know for sure if there's um, some sort of system wide level um, intervention we can can enact. Um, but that's a that's a great point. Um, and then uh, from Dr. Fedwick, um, is serotonin syndrome more common in overdose uh, or when patients are on multiple agents with serotonergic activity? Okay. Therapeutic. I found this on dose the web. ranges. Um, the uh, so I have I have a slide on that. Um, let's see if I can flip to it. Um, uh, so it, that one that answer the answer to that one kind of depends um, which agents they are on. Uh, MAOIs um, are by far the worst, uh, the, like the biggest culprit in producing serotonin toxicity, and. Um, the interaction between drugs is, is what seems to be the biggest driver because they're using two different mechanisms. Um, the two drugs, whatever the combination of the two drugs patient around, they're using two different mechanisms to drive up the amount of serotonin. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the overdose, it's actually like, it's actually quite, it's actually fairly uncommon um, to see serotonin syndrome in overdose of the SSRIs. They're actually a very, very safe drug. Um, and, and you have to take it like a really large amount of medication to overdose on it. Um, yeah, and, and basically you can get a, a serotonin, if you look in the literature, you'll find serotonin syndrome arising from a massive variety um, of cases from being on uh, single agents at therapeutic doses, uh, rare, but it has happened to, um, you know, massive overdoses and, and combinations. I don't know if Dr. Lusick's here, if he could, um, has, a, has a more um, succinct way of putting that. Oh, hi, Scott Lusick here. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that, Greg. So, um, you know, I agree. And <clears throat> to look at, at kind of both Aaron and Jason's comments and maybe answer them, them both together. So I agree. I mean, I think the, you know, one of the issues with tramadol uh, is, is it being basically under-recognized uh, what the pharmacokinetics of it actually are. And so, you know, one of the initial problems, I think, with it is that you know, where we are seeing it prescribed a lot is in a couple of cases. So one being where, you know, uh, physicians aren't carrying a triplicate with them. And so they say, well, I'm just going to give you tramadol instead because it's not actually an opioid. Uh, 
which is not true in any in any sense. Tramadol is absolutely an opioid, uh, and and as uh, uh, Ryan Trang has, has mentioned as well, if you read Dr. Dave Yerling is a uh, a Clint Farm and Tox guy in uh, in Ontario who uh, is on quite a pedestal about uh, you know the the harms of tramadol, and he's written a bunch of different things about it. And so essentially, you know, tramadol is. Uh, you're giving a drug that's going to get metabolized into both an opioid and an SNRI. Uh, and so, you know, the thought is, if you're going to give an SNRI, give an SNRI. And if you're going to give an opioid, give an opioid. But giving tramadol is just a, a dirty, messy drug that leads to a lot of complications. Um, the, the other issue that I think with this and, and where I've seen it is in people who are concerned with giving codeine. So for a couple of reasons. So one being that, well, maybe does, codeine doesn't work for you know 7% of the population. Uh, but then also we get these ultra rapid metabolizers of codeine and you can get you know increased toxicity from it. The problem with that rationale though, is that the way that tramadol is metabolized is the same way as codeine. And so, so the same problems that are inherent with, with codeine metabolism are exactly the same with tramadol. And so, you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't really uh, hold any, any truth to, or, or make any sense to, to use one over the other. Um, and so, so those are some of the reasons I think we're seeing it more often. Uh, and to address Aaron's, Aaron's question, we haven't seen um, a lot of, of increase with this. And, and this gets into Jason's question as well, where, you know, most serotonin toxicities that we see that are clinically significant are related to overdoses. Now, that being said, you'll see patients coming in who have serotonin toxicity. And this, again, gets to what Greg was talking about, of how this truly is a spectrum of disease. And so your patient who comes in who has started on tramadol and comes in with, you know, can't sleep and has restless legs has serotonin toxicity. Right? So whether or not they meet Hunter's criteria is irrelevant. They have toxicity related to increased serotonin. And so, you know, it certainly does happen, but it, but it doesn't tend to be clinically all that, all that significant um, for the most part, uh, you know, compared to what we, what we typically see with, uh, with overdoses. The, the other thing is, um, again, getting to Jason's question of the, of the multiple agents, Again, that's, it's much more common that we see serotonin toxicity from patients who are on uh, multiple serotonergic agents. And so, you know, the, the young kid who, who's on an SSRI who then goes to a rave and uses ecstasy or MDMA is a common patient that we'll see uh, when they're getting the multiple different uh, drugs that are serotonergic uh, as, as ones who come in with more significant serotonin toxicity. It looks like Dr. Ingrid Vikas has a uh, question. Um, is it all right if I allow them to ask the question live, Dr. Beller? Yeah, of course. All right, go ahead, Dr. Vikas. Hi, this is Ingrid Vikas. Um, so I, I, one, one of my comments I've typed in, but the other one I would like to sort of talk about. So um, I've looked after quite a number of these patients over the years, and uh, the hyperthermia component is a very concerning symptom and uh, carries poor prognosis. Um, so from a practical perspective, uh, I just want to remind people to make sure that you ask the temperatures be repeated every 15 minutes or so. I have seen uh, these patients go from a normal temperature to a temperature of over 42 degrees within the space of 30 to 60 minutes. And if you can pick that, pick that up by frequent temperature checks, then you can get on treating it aggressively early on. Um, uh, so, uh, so Greg, thank you very much for, uh, for a very complete uh, uh, you know, presentation and also great slides. Um, there is one other uh, pharmacologic agent that hasn't been mentioned that I would like to raise because I think it may be useful in the, as one additional tool in the armamentarium of uh, treating these patients with severe hyperthermia, um, and, uh, and that's dantrolene. 
And uh, I'd refer you to uh, an interesting paper that was published a while back. Uh, it was a systematic review done looking at dantrolene and the treatment of hyperpyrexia in MDMA specifically. And it was a group out of Vancouver, actually. Um, and they found that there was uh, increased mortality in those patients that were not treated with dantrolene. In fact, if they were treated with dantrolene, the mortality rate was 19% versus 44%. Uh, with the dantrolene, without the, you know, so the dantrolene. Um, and uh, when they looked specifically at those people that had temperatures of over, over 42 degrees, if they were given dantrolene, their survival rate was 62%, whereas it was zero in the patients who were not given dantrolene. Um, that is sort of there also in temperatures between 40 and 41, with 100% survival with dantrolene and 56% uh, without dantrolene and then becomes uh, less important in the lower ones. So in your really sick patients, I might consider looking at dantrolene before you go into, into paralysis. It may be uh, a very useful way. I know there's a lot of controversy about how it works and why it works and shouldn't it work, but on a practical basis, I have used it a number of times, uh, probably about half a dozen to a dozen times over the years, and it has been a useful uh, a tool uh, to think about, but certainly not something I would use in everybody, obviously. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Dr. Farguson asked, in terms of cooling, what is the best method? Immersion in uh, ice bath doesn't seem possible in the ED. Um, did have a slide on this. So uh, just going back to the hyperthermia, I was talking about using a, a, a rectal probe to get your active, te active temp uh, accurate temperatures and Dr. Vicus is, is repeating that um, uh, often to keep track. Um, obviously the first thing you wanna do is remove all the patient's clothing. Uh, there's a couple of methods I've seen uh, and I didn't, I didn't delve into the hyperthermia literature too deeply on this. Um, evaporation is probably the most uh, effective way that our body uh, releases heat. So spraying the patient down with cool water and setting up fans and having the fans spray the water off, um, putting uh, wet towels on them, uh, getting ice packs and putting it in their, their axilla, their groin. Um, as, far, as far as the tub goes, I think if we have some sort of um, waterproof kind of sheet or, or cover that we can put under the patient, then you can kind of fill that up with ice and water. I've actually never done this um, in the eMERGE myself. So if, if Dr. Lusick has a has it anything to add on, on the cooling? Yeah, so what, what I would do with these patients is, uh, is you're right, it makes quite a mess, but the, the best way to do this uh, is, is basically packing them in ice like a fish. And so what I do is put a sheet underneath them, put a sheet over top of them, and then you just cover them in, in ice and water. Um, and, and is really the best way uh, to kind of expose all of your, your uh, cooling sort of, uh, mechanisms that we have because doing things like cold IV fluids isn't going to do anything when their temperature is 42 degrees and so really that's your that's your best option uh, is to really try to cover the the highest amount of surface area and certainly like Greg said you know getting to where the big blood vessels are in the groin in the neck in the axilla uh, but then also just really covering as much as much surface area with with ice and with water as you can uh, certainly when they're getting to those very high temperatures of, of above 41 degrees Celsius. Awesome. Great. Um, uh, Dr. Kumar, are you taking them off monitor when you're cooling them? Otherwise, I imagine the leads wouldn't stay on. I'm not sure. I don't know if you can tape the leads on. It becomes a challenge. All right, um, great. Well, if there's no other questions, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to Dr. Scott Lusick for uh, uh, his guidance on this and, and everyone who asked questions. Um, appreciate it. Hope everyone has a good day.